Lo studio della sindone, ma anche il semplice avvicinarsi al telo che avrebbe avvolto il corpo di Cristo deposto dalla croce, porta con sé alcuni richiami differenti tra loro ma intrecciati. C'è l'aspetto scientifico, il profilo storico, l'elemento culturale, l'aspetto spirituale. Sullo sfondo una domanda, per certi versi doppia, che riguarda non solo il credente. Che cosa dice la sindone? Che cosa dice proprio a me? E ancora, perché ci è stata data? Il studio della sindone chiama in causa tanti aspetti differenti ma tra loro intrecciati l'aspetto scientifico, l'aspetto culturale, l'aspetto storico, l'aspetto naturalmente spirituale. Eh, padre Andrew, ma eh, perché c'è tanto interesse intorno alla sindone? It really depends who you ask. So if you ask Christians, they're going to say, well the shroud is infinitely important because It contains an image of the Savior, the blood that's absorbed into this cloth is the blood that was shed for my salvation. This is an image of perfect love. It's an act of devotion that one makes when one kneels before the shroud or makes a pilgrimage to Turin. That's their interest. Their interest is to tap into the power of the Paschal mystery. And of course, for long centuries, that has been what has motivated so many Christians to come before the shroud, to study the shroud, perhaps, but above all, to enact their faith, to live this out, to, to recall the mystery. Um, of course, you're going to get a very different answer if you ask a scientist. And, and this is what's interesting. This is what's new. Really, only as of the last uh, century or so has this new chapter of shroud studies been open. And there, the question is completely different. Really, the question is, what formed this enigmatic image? In what way did it come into being, this image that is utterly unique, that acts unlike anything else we've ever seen? There is no other funerary monument, no, no burial clause that bear the image of a crucified man. And so the scientists scratch their heads to say, um, how do I explain this? So it's this great mystery, it's a great story really of um, how do we solve a puzzle? And so this is what gave birth to a lot of, in recent times, the, the highest powered laboratories in America, as of 1978, for example, they came together to petition the king, the royal family, to have a period of 120 hours in front of this cloth to do a whole battery of exams so that they might get to the bottom of a single question. What formed the image? Is it a painting? Is it a scorch? Is it a rubbing? Some sort of ancient photography? Those were the four theories that they, they went into their studies with, but they came home with more questions than they had answers. And so it remains an open question today. And so wherever there are open questions, scientists are going to remain interested. So those are two very different approaches, aren't they? The, the Christian approach and, and the scientific approach. If you ask me personally, you know, Father Andrew, why are you interested in the Shroud? I think I would give yet a third answer, and that is, I think the Shroud is an amazing opportunity, an amazing tool of evangelization. Precisely because we have this modern interest in science, And precisely because the shroud gives us so much scientific information that satisfies the modern uh, inquisitor, well, I think it's a great opportunity for that important conversation 
of the interplay between faith and reason, the, the reasons to believe. And so my personal stance is that the shroud is the natural effect of a supernatural event, namely the resurrection. And that's what I want to talk about. That's what I'm interested to share with, with people all over the world. So I think there's different answers to that question depending on where you're coming from, a scientist, a Christian, or an evangelizer. Un approccio anche molto interessante, questo aspetto personale eh, che lei ha citato, ma eh, torniamo per un attimo al dato, alla ricerca scientifica, che riguarda quella che potremmo definire, magari banalizzando un po', la cosiddetta autenticità, cioè il modo in cui l'immagine si è formata, ma anche il tempo e il luogo in cui questo è avvenuto. Diciamo che sotto questo profilo davvero la sindone è qualcosa di unico, di speciale. That's exactly right. It's one of a kind, and this, this needs to be underscored even today. What is it that really sets it apart? What puts it in a category all its own from a scientific point of view? Well, for, for, there are two elements that I would, I would point out, and the first was discovered in 1898, and this is when Secondo Pia snaps the first photograph of the shroud. Of course, dactylographs in those days were much bigger and quite uh, impressive uh, in the way that they developed the film. The, the picture that came to light for Secondo Pia there in the dark room. Can you imagine his surprise here being the first one to photograph the shroud? All we ever looked at, all human eyes ever saw was what's th the pale image that's on this ancient cloth. But imagine his surprise when in the dark room, that, that plate inside of that solution begins to form and he sees the photographic negative of that image. But it's no negative at all. That's the positive image. And so he must have wanted to drop the plate in, in front of, in, in his own hands and said, oh my God, what is, what is this perfect, anatomically perfect image that is it's just stunning? What, what might have seen like a faint, image of, okay, eye, ear, nose, and lips, all of a sudden becomes perfectly detailed and photographic in its qualities. And so people start scratching their heads. Secondo Pia, where did you get this image? This is too good to be true. But what was discovered there in that day was that the shroud, unlike any other image on impressed upon a burial cloth, is that the shroud acts as if it were a photographic document. And this is, this is mind-boggling. Here we are 19 centuries before the invention of photography when Jesus' body is in contact with that cloth, according to the Gospels, right? So how in the world is it producing a photographic document when there are no cameras, when there are no photographs? And so you can see the reaction to Seconde Pia's photograph historically. We have correspondence uh, um, with scientists at the time, right at the turn of the century, the 20th century. And then, as now, the shroud is a sign of contradiction. Many people in the scientific community were not prepared to hear that there was scientific evidence, material traces of Christ's existence. That was, that was problematic. That was scandalous for some ears to hear. So much so that Yves Delage, um, writing uh, at the, that exact time will be laughed out of the scientific community when he concludes that the man of the shroud is Jesus of Nazareth simply put because that body recorded in this photographic like image is anatomically perfect and it shows evidence of a man who suffered this unique combination of pathologies which correspond exactly to what we read about in the scriptures and and so that's the first element that the shroud acts as a photographic document, but it's not the only one. Um, the scientific community is also very much aware of this, this data that came to light in 1976 and then was studied more profoundly in 1978 in the so-called STIRP, or Shroud of Turin Research Project. And this is when Eric Jumper and John Jackson, studying at the United States Air Force Academy, 
discover that the shroud actually contains 3D information. This is hard to explain. Uh, imagine a cloth that's two-dimensional, it's perfectly flat, and yet when you put it under the VP8 image analyzer, we're able to create a brightness map that we can rotate around its axes and show the three-dimensional qualities of a man. And that means that impressed in a two-dimensional cloth, with technology, we are able to extract information that's there, but is not visible unless acted upon with new instruments. And these new instruments were first applied in the 1970s. And so this, was, this is the discovery that will really mobilize the science of our day in the, in the modern period. The discovery that the shroud contains three-dimensional information that is really what invites the scientists to, to study more profoundly and get to the bottom of this question, what formed this image that, that is unlike anything else we've, we've ever seen? Torniamo per un attimo al piano più strettamente spirituale, in questo senso ci aiutano eh, i papi. San Giovanni Paolo II definiva la sindone eh, specchio del Vangelo, Benedetto XVI o viceversa l'ha definita icona del sabato santo e Papa Francesco, eh, proprio in un messaggio abbastanza recente, l'ha indicata come un'icona di Gesù eh, crocifisso. Non c'è dubbio che eh, quindi la sindone interpella, interroga anche la nostra fede. Può essere anche uno strumento, una prova della fede stessa. The word proof is quite strong. I wouldn't say that the shroud is, is a proof of faith or a proof of the resurrection. Uh, the resurrection is a dogma of faith that we assent to with, with faith, which is a theological gift. But that's not to say that we don't have reasons to believe. And I think one of those reasons to believe is exactly what the Shroud records and the testimony that it gives. So this is where the Gospel is helpful. If you recall the way the Shroud was first discovered as it's recounted there in John chapter 20, what's interesting is that on Easter Sunday, Mary Magdalene, she gets up very early in the morning to go visit the tomb of Jesus, but she didn't get up early enough, I suppose, because the tomb is empty, Jesus is gone. And so she runs and tells Peter and the beloved disciple, John, and they go racing to the tomb. Of course, John is younger and I suppose faster. He gets there first and, and he goes, he doesn't go into the tomb. What he does instead is he stoops low as to get a good angle to see deep inside. And what does he see? That's the first thing that, that the evangelist mentions. He saw the burial cloths. And, and yet it's from a distance that he sees. Then comes Peter, huffing and puffing. I suppose he gets there a little bit later. Now he steps into the tomb. He goes down those stairs, cross that threshold where the sliding um, stone door would have been. And now he gets up close and personal with the cloths. What does the evangelist record? That he saw he saw the othonia, the burial cloths, the linen cloths. And you say, okay, John, uh, thanks for sharing all of these details. I appreciate it. Where are we going with this story? This is where he reaches his climax. When John, the one who got there first, follows after Peter and he goes in and now seeing the cloths, but not just seeing the cloths, seeing certain aspects, certain qualities about this cloth, it says, quite dramatically, he saw and believed. And this is where I want to take the evangelist by the lapels and shake him and say, what did he see so that he believed? What is it about the dirty laundry lying on the tomb's floor that requires this conclusion? Belief and belief in what? The resurrection just from seeing dirty clothes on the, on the ground? And this is where you got to pay really close attention to the details, to the modifiers, to the description that the uh, evangelist gives us. And he says only one word. He only gives us one qualifier that this cloth, this, this burial cloth, it says that, that it's lying. And, and translators have grappled with this. What, what do you mean? Is it lying on the ground? In Greek, it doesn't say lying on the ground. Some translations add, it was lying there. 
it doesn't say in the original languages that it was lying there. What it says is that it was lying. And, and, and what this means, I think, is that it was lying flat. In other words, John was there on Friday. He saw Jesus crucified. He took him down and laid him in the tomb along with the other men and women that accompanied him to the burial site. He saw then how the body of Jesus was wrapped inside of this shroud. And so here he is the next day, shortly after. We're now shortly over one day. We're on Easter Sunday in the early hours of the morning. And what does he see? That same, that same cloth in the same position, the same orientation, and yet no body inside. It's as if the body is dematerialized and now the cloth lies flat. What I'm suggesting is that even in the gospel, there may be little hints that something about the condition of the tomb, the way that it was, the conditions of what he saw suggested that this Jesus had died, yes, but also risen exactly as he said. And so when John sees these elements, these reasons to believe, he takes the first baby steps towards faith in the resurrection. Of course, that faith will be shored up then after when he sees and encounters the living and resurrected Jesus. But the first steps towards distinctively Christian faith come when John meets a witness. In this case, it's a silent witness. It's the shroud that bears testimony of what it saw. Mary didn't see it. She wasn't up early enough. But think of this, that the only thing that was present in the moment the cadaver becomes a living body again is the cloth that wraps that body. And so I think it's fascinating that when it speaks, when it bears witness, when it presents itself, that's exactly when John begins to believe. And so I think there's a role even today for Christians and inquisitors, just people of goodwill, to probe the shroud, ask the questions, and um, see where it takes them. Might they have the same experience that, that John did? Might they see in this silent testimony that actually there are reasons to believe that Jesus died and rose? I think the arguments are strong. <laughs>
I mean, how many times in our churches or in holy images, sacred images, do you see a crown where there's kind of like a ring around the head, but it leaves the top of the head exposed, right? And yet that's not what we see on the Shroud of Turin. Instead, it's more like a helmet that covers the entire surface, every area, some 30 or 50 wounds penetrating not just the skin, but all the way to the bony plate below. We have evidence of thorns that are some three quarters of an inch long. We speculate that the, the species of plant that was used to make this crown was the Zisophis spina Christi. The very Latin name indicates the thorns of Christ. And, and yet this wicker, bl uh, this pliant branch that was used to gather together a messy clump of thorns and then you know, placed on top of the head is not what an artist would have likely invented just working out of uh, our memory or some sacred tradition. Instead, what we see on the shroud is that it departs from that enshrined tradition and gives us instead something which is actu actually historically plausible. So for example, in the first century, a crown, a stephanos, if we might use the, the Greek word, did take the shape of what we would call a helmet. It's, you know, later in medieval times when it was very popular to have the, the, the crown that would be like a ring or a circlet around the ears that left the top of the head open. But instead, the shroud gives us something very different. But what I would just signal beyond this, and this is, I don't know how you think about the crown of thorns or what importance it has for you, but I always thought as a young person at least, mm, ouch, right? Like, this was that element of the passions of Christ that just really struck me as painful on a physical level. And yet I knew that that wasn't enough. I knew that we have to go deeper than that. And this is really, a lot of my work is to see the juxtaposition of science and faith, not just what we can construe about the sufferings of the man, but now turning to scripture to say, what does it all mean? What significance, what theological message does it bear? And so I just wanna quickly, if you'll allow me, point out one little element about the theological importance of this shroud, as well as the historical importance, because this is often missed. The, the crown indicates something theologically very deep. Namely, because it is uh, constructed of thorns, one must ask, well, what is the meaning of a thorn? If you go back to Genesis, what you'll find out is that there are no, there are no th thorns, no, no thorns or thistles in the original garden. Tuttavia, nel 1988, la radiodatazione con il carbonio 14 sembrò stabilire eh, che la sindone risaliva all'età medievale. Allora, tutto questo discorso, come si incrocia con questi dati scientifici? That's a good question, and it needs to be addressed. And to be honest, um, there's probably not the time here to go into it in, in as much depth as, we, as I'd like. I'd, I would point people in the direction of our postgraduate certificate in Shroud Studies, because this is something we dive deep into, especially in the most recent studies. Some just came out uh, in, in recent years, really, with the work of Tristan Casabianca, who brings to light now raw data that wasn't available to us in 1988. And so what was published in 1988 was that the shroud must be medieval. It dates, in fact, to the years 1260 to 1390. And so situated in the Middle Ages, certainly it doesn't belong to the person of Jesus of Nazareth, or so it was said. And this made front page news all over the world, silencing shroud studies, shroud studies mind you, for probably some 19 years. It really wasn't until 2005 with some important publications that brought to light and called into question the, the importance, the significance of the, the 1988 findings. So I will point out one major flaw or at least problem with the, the, the scientific test of 1988 and it has to do with where they cut the sample. They, they picked that top left corner this is very problematic for a number of reasons, but really, if you were to just go back to 1970, now 10 years before the carbon dating, and look at a brightness map which shows the chemical composition of the cloth, 
what you're going to find is that top left corner is utterly unlike the rest of the cloth. Uh, someone in kindergarten could look at that map of colors and see, look, mom, it's all the same colors. It's orange, it's, it's yellow, it's, it's red, it's all these earthy tones. But in that top left corner, it was forest green. And so already people were beginning to theorize that there was material not from the first century, but maybe from the 16th century. Maybe this was used to repair an area of the cloth that had a lot of wear and tear. Certainly there, there is a lot of fungus. There's a, a lot of buildup of other residues. There's plant the gum, something that was used, it looks like, to dye portions of the cloth. There are a number of questions here that I don't have the time to go into, but this is an, an area that we study with the help of modern science. And it's helpful for people to know that nowadays it's the scientific community. It's, it's not merely religious kind of fringe lunatics over here that are saying, no, the shroud, need the, the, the dating of 1988 needs to be called into question. No, it's the scientists themselves that are saying it's no longer legitimate to point to the dates from 1988 and determine conclusively that the shroud is medieval. That is, that's no longer a tenable position from a scientific point of view. Sotto il profilo dell'approccio scientifico naturalmente la domanda delle domande, così come eh, abbiamo sentito anche adesso, riguarda la datazione della sindrome. Un altro aspetto e viceversa l'elemento che pertiene alla sua conservazione, alla sua custodia. Ma dal punto di vista scientifico che cosa aspetta la sindrome? Yeah, so every year or so there is a convention which brings together scientists to ask this exact question, what, what's the future of scientific study on the Shroud? And there's some very interesting proposals, given the new instruments that we have, the, the new methodologies that are available to us that certainly weren't available in the 1970s when the, the Shroud was, was studied so exhaustively by the Shroud of Turin Research Project. Now there are new things to do. So, for example, one of the things that fascinates me is, you know, there's pollen that is studied in, on the Shroud. But some of this pollen may be lodged in blood. And wouldn't it be interesting if we could identify those pollen grains that certainly date to the time of burial because they're actually in the blood. That's just one little example of the kind of research that might be done today. But again, scientists have proposed many new, many new things. And I'm for that. I think that ought to be done in, in the future. Of course, it ought to be done in a responsible way. It's something that the scientific community can then really accept and, and embrace as significant. But beyond that, even before we get to new science and uh, new experiments, I want to say we are situated right now in the present in a very good position in order to share what we already know with the world that doesn't yet know it. And especially, I would say, to those who are in the work of evangelization, this is prime time. This is the moment when we can speak to the person of Jesus, what he suffered and why he suffered in a compelling way. Do you know so many young people today say they don't believe because, in a word, science. Science is the reason that they think it conflicts with faith, and so I've got, I've got to pick one or the other. It's either I, I, I cling to the science and throw out my Bible, or I cling to my faith and do away with science. And modern people are not willing to do away with science, and so faith suffers. But, you know, I think here we have a really interesting instance of the marriage of faith and reason, because it's, it's as if we relive that gospel episode with St. Thomas. Remember the skeptic who comes before the risen Christ and he had said, I will not believe unless I stick my finger in his side, if I press, press my hands into the wounds of his crucifixion, I will not believe. And yet we can do something quite similar, can't we, today with the Shroud of Turin. Come, press and probe, study with your microscopes and your x-ray and your infrared and all the rest. But do not be unbelieving, but believe. And I think there's actually an opportunity for the modern-day skeptics to study the Shroud, 
um, in, in the most minute and uh, precise ways, but then realize the limits of what science can discover. And really what we have to ask then is this, this bigger question of who is the man of the shroud? And I want to say that science brings us very far indeed to know the sufferings of this man, how he carried a cross, how he wore a, thor a crown of thorns, how he scourged from head to toe. Um, but beyond that, the, the love that is here implied the, the, the fact that he rose from the dead, as I think there are reasons to believe, all of this is an amazing opportunity for us to bring people to really ask the big questions about who Jesus is and what it is he accomplished on the cross. And I think that's a wonderful time and we ought to share that. And so I would simply invite them to, to study and to, to explore places like this at a, in a museum like our, ours here in Rome. I wish this were in every parish, in every school across the world. I, think, I wish there were people that were prepared to speak about it, to share about it, because I just think it's, it's such a, an, an impassioned question, a, a worthy pursuit.